Welcome to this sermon from Silver Lake Baptist Church. Our mission is to celebrate the greatness of God with all we are for the joy, hope, and renewal of our community. We are so glad you have chosen to listen to our message. We pray you will be blessed by your time with us today. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? Good morning. Good morning. Can I get a little closer to you guys? Okay. Cool. Awesome. That's cool. Yeah. Good morning. How are you guys doing? Um, I'm so thankful to be here this morning. It's always a blessing. Um, and I'm thankful for this day because this is truly the 4th of July. And I was thinking about what Jim was saying where it's the 4th of July. Like when I was a kid, I was like, it's the 4th of July. Yay. We get to blow stuff up, man. <laughs> and so we, we get shoot bottle rockets at each other and roman candles and like that all kinds of fun man except where i'm grew up in oklahoma they had wheat fields and so usually about this time of year they've already cut the wheat and so it's just stubble so you got to be real careful because that's kind of a blaze and i've seen a few of those get lit off too with with bottle rockets and stuff and it can get a little western because it can turn a festive festivity of a few lights into a raging fire you know but I think there's something inside us. There's a spark of freedom that, that we don't get just as Americans, but that we get from God. And it's the same thing. It looks like it's just a little light here and there, but when God lets it loose, it turns into a raging fire and, and we can change the world and we can see God do great things in our lives that we never ever dreamed possible. So, <clears throat> Yesterday, I had the privilege of officiating a wedding for for um, our chaplain's daughter up in Darrington, and and um, it was on the it's on the Fourth of July, and so um, my friend he he's a character, so he orders this tent for the wedding, but on the top of it's red, white, and blue, and I was like, how fitting is that? Because like it it represents so much. The, in in the colors and and um, I just wanted to read this to you because I thought it was important and and um, <clears throat> I think sometimes we just think well things just kind of appeared because they appeared but we forget that sometimes there's a working out of things there was a working out in our country of what even the colors meant right there's still a working out in our country of our freedoms and and we're not all always perfect, but we're always growing. There's nothing perfect, but but we get the opportunity to grow, and we get the opportunity to make a difference. And so, um, they were talking about the colors, and and um, I'll read this as if I can see it. Okay, um, it says this heraldic devices such as sil that's a fancy word for a cowboy by the way <laughs> right can you believe i said that word devices such as seals have specific meanings for each element and color and the u.s seal was no exception charles thompson secretary of the continental congress explained the significance to the congress when he presented the seal the colors the colors thompson said at the time are those used in the flag of the United States of America. White signifies purity and innocence. Red, hardiness and valor. And blue signifies vigilance, perseverance, and justice. And I thought about that because we get that all through God. We get that all through the finished work of the cross. It's only because of the red. It's only because of the blood that we even have anything to stand on, right? That's what brings our purity. That's what makes us righteous standing before God is the blood of the Lamb. And He didn't just give it to us to... to you know, I was thinking about when um, Adam and Eve sinned and God killed the animal and He covered Adam with the skin of the, of the animal. And so much of the time... Like, we have, have these opinions of God that we think God's this big, mean ogre that just wants to beat us over the head and so angry over li every little thing. And that's not who my daddy is. Like, I grew up thinking he was like that. I grew up thinking he, he, he was a nasty, mean old dude up there that didn't like me. And like, I had some neighbors like that, man. 
Like, like there's a few neighbors, if you ran across their field, they'd be shooting buckshot at you, you know? And so that's when real gun control should have happened, right? You get rock salt and stuff, you know, it's no fun, right? But that's not who, who our Father is. That's not who God is. And we get this opinion of Him based, maybe it's based on, on someone we knew, or maybe it's based on our own father, or our own grandfather, or our lack of that in our lives. And we don't realize, realize His heart towards us. And how much he loves us. And so, as, as he covers Adam, the Bible says that Adam was, they were ashamed. They realized they were naked. They had a consciousness now, hey, wait, uh, we're, we don't have, we're not who we think before. They were, they were righteous, but now they had the knowledge of the tree of the good and evil. And now they're like, man, I, I ain't got nothing to offer you. And he says, it's okay. I'm going to take care of you. I, I want to cleanse your conscience. I want to cleanse your heart and let you know that I'm still with you. And so what did he do? He killed an animal. And he covered him with it. And that's the same thing our Father God has done for us today. And so when I see red, I think of the blood. What can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. It's gory. It's messy. People don't like to talk about it. But God did not do that for just His satisfaction. He did it for our conscience. Our consciences. Can I say that? That's too big of a word for, for me to say. It's like a tongue twister. Like, like Peter Piper picked it. Anyway. But He did it for our hearts. So that we could have a clear heart. And we can know that we're righteous and that we're holy. We're always trying to be righteous and holy. And, and it, it's like... like um, like telling your car to be a car, you know, you're already that. Like it's it's you're that. Once you have accepted Jesus as your Savior, you're righteous. And so, I think it's so important that we get that in our hearts and get that in our conscience, because the Bible says, "Though our sins, uh, um, though our sins, uh, he will, though our sins be as scarlet, he will wash them white as snow." Now think of that. Though they be as scarlet, he says, I'm going to make you pure in my heart. I'm going to make you pure in my love. I'm going to do something in you that you can't do yourself. The, um, David said, create a new heart in me. Right? He's like, like create. He's like, man, this heart I got is rotten, but I know when I connect with you and I find out who I really am and I'm covered by the blood, of the perfect sacrifice lamb that I can walk and know that I am a son and not a servant. Know that I have hope. Know that I have a future and I can walk in peace like I've never walked in peace before. Not because I'm good, because I'm not, but because He is. And that's what makes me righteous and that's what makes me holy. And now I can walk around with some swag, you know, you know, I had this shirt that, that that had swag on it, and everybody's like, "Why are you Why are you wearing that shirt around?" You know, you know what swag means. And I was like, "Yeah, it's okay to have swag, right?" I I worked with um, one of my mentors. He's like a five-time world champion, a five-time, four or five-time reserve world world champion, cutting horse trainer. He's like like the godfather. They should have named Will Rogers Coliseum after him, right? It should have his name on it, not Will Rogers, right? Although I love Will Rogers. He's an Okie. He's cool, right? But I go to the ranch and work with him and him and his son and his grandkids. Man, there's something about a champion when they walk, right? There's something about they know who they are. They know what they've accomplished and they know what they can. And so they walk different. They talk different. And it's contagious, right? And so they have a swag to them, man. There's a swag to them and there's a confidence. And that's why they can walk in and beat everybody is because they know they're champions and they know that they're good at what they do. And it's okay to know that, that um, we're good at stuff. It's okay for us to excel in life. It's a, okay for us to, to um, be confident in who we are and what we're doing. So much of the time, I think religion puts this thing where it puts you down so much where I just got to be humble and, 
and, and poor and but there there's a misinterpretation not just poor but but um oh i'm just nobody and truth is we all of us were nobody till we met jesus right but we were enough enough of a somebody that god gave his highest his highest most valuable um I don't want to say possession because the son's not really a possession, but his highest, most valuable thing in his life, he gave that for you. So really, even when we say we were a nobody before Jesus, really not to God. Because God said, even while we were yet sinners, God sent his son Christ for us to die for us. So that means that you're valuable. And so this nobody thing, I don't buy no more. Like that was an old season a long time ago. Even if you're out there and you don't know Jesus, you're not a nobody. You're not a nothing. God saw so much value in you. He gave his son Jesus to die on the cross for you. And that makes you valuable. That makes you the most valuable thing on the earth. He already owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And he owns the hills on that. He owns everything. Like one day, you know... 200 years from now we're all going to be gone but this stuff's still going to be here but his main value was not in stuff or or the earth or anything else he didn't he didn't give he didn't give jesus to to die for for um a volcano or die for land he gave his only son for you for you and that makes you really, really valuable. And that that gives us a hope. Like he says in Jeremiah, he says, I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to give you a hope and a future. He's like got good things in mind, man. We're, we're always looking for bad things to hit us, right? I put a post on Facebook yesterday it, it, is stop preparing for things to fail prepare for things to work out do you ever get where you're just so beat up all the time and it's so so hard and everything's going so bad that you just have no hope like there's no hope we we had um come back from montana and i brought two mares and a couple babies back with me and and um the the divider wasn't enough i didn't feel confident to divide the mares and the babies up because i didn't want a baby to get squished on the trip back and so um i just turned them all in together one of the mares was a lead herd mare and the other one was probably on the bottom of the of the totem pole or the pecking pole right so we're driving her down the road and we'll hear this and i'm like earthquake linda's like we're in montana they don't have earthquakes it's like volcano no but we're here here the whole trailer shaking man and I'm like, what in the world? How is this happening? What, what's going on, right? And then the next thing we know, we hear, do it again. So I look back in there, and this one mare's like um, being nasty to the other mare. She, she, was, she was like not letting her drink water and keeping her baby away from her, and she was just hogging everything. And finally we got to a place, and we pulled over at a gas station. It was the next day, and I would be like, stop it. Leave them alone. And... and um, this one mare had her head dropped and you could tell she she was like submitting to that mare and she was telling her with everything she had look i am here and i know who you are and i'm totally submitted to you and so i got back in there and i was like like hey you her name her name is peps i was like peps get your head up and i was like come here and drink water and I let her drink water and, and I just let her have a break for a minute from being, you know, just beat up by the world. And I prayed over him and I talked to him. I was like, you guys have greatness in you. You guys are great. You have a legacy and a future and a hope. And I just started talking life to him and I prayed for him. So we drive on down the road and we stop at the next stop. And guess what happened? There's no more kicking. There's no more fighting. I walk around there and horses will put go neck to neck and they'll groom each other, right? And so they're sitting there grooming each other in the trailer and totally had accepted each other. And I was just like, because I felt so bad, like, because I put her in that trailer with that mare and like, I can't get them out alongside the highway, you know? And I was like, well, why didn't I pray at the start, right? But I think sometimes in life, we feel like that mare 
feel like, man, I'm trapped in here. I like I'm getting beat up on and, and I have no place to go and no place to move and there's no hope for me and and I don't know what to do and it's not like a hee haw thing where you're like just feeling sorry for yourself like whoa it was me and agony on me and then your hound dogs are you know going off some of you guys will get that <laughs> right but it's a real thing it's something that has been that has beaten you down and has has just obliterated you and it's made it where it feels like there's no hope and like I'm never going to get out of this and so I'm just going to submit to this situation and I'm just going to going to hope somehow that it gets better. And then one day someone comes along says, "Hey, get your head up." Get your head up and come here and drink some water. And and let me talk to you and let me tell you who you really are and tell you the greatness that's in you. And let me pray with you. And you know something? Something changes. Something changes in that. And I'm so thankful that God's so good in that way. And it made me think of, 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 of another lady in the Bible who was kind of getting beat up like that mare, you know. And um, you're like, Pastor James, what are you talking about? You know, it's the 4th of July. You're supposed to be like fireworks and all this other stuff. Well, we'll get those later. <laughs> right? But I was thinking about the, the a woman in here. But it starts out in, um, I'm going to read the scripture and then I'm going to work backwards. In um, John 8... 31 it says this to the Jews who had believed him Jesus said if you hold to my teachings you are really my disciples then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free and then he goes on and and it down to verse 35 says actually let me read 33 it says they answered him we are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone how can you say that that we are set free. He's like, dude, we're free. In America, we're free. We've never been slaves to anyone. Now, our founding fathers, that was a different story, right? When 56 men sat down and wrote the Declaration of Independence, they wrote out 27 grievances and said, this is not happening anymore. They stood their ground and said, you know something? By God's providence and God's design God created us to be free men in whom the sun set free is free indeed and no man has any right to rule over us no government has any right to rule over us in fact we're gonna rule and we're each gonna have a partnership it's the greatest partnership ever because each one of us has equal say in this country on everything except certain things and that's a bill of rights because this was given to us right that's not to be taken away by any tyrant by any any um governor by any king or by a majority these are god given rights that are given to us so that we can live and we have those rights and we have those freedoms right so it i think about these men they they weren't They'd never, they weren't like us because they had, they had been under a thumb. They had been under a rule. They, they, they were subjects to a king that wasn't the king of kings. And somehow they got this ideal that, you know something? We're free. God's the one who gives us our freedom. And we're not to, we don't have to submit to any man as our king but we'll submit to god and we'll set up this ideal and this ideal has become this country it's not perfect man it messed up tons of times and we'll mess up tons more but the thing is is we have a basis and a foundation that is based on something that is immovable and that is that they saw what god saw that we are free and whom the sun sets free is free indeed and that's good news. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't mean it's not political. It doesn't make you a Democrat or a Republican or Independent or a Green or an Orange or a Purple or whatever party. It makes you American. We each get 
equal say. We're each partners in this great freedom. And that's great. So they had all these grievances. And then they signed it. And I love when they signed it, they said this. And for the support of this declaration with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. And what they said, they were risking their lives, right? And they, they were risking their lives for, for something that, that was greater and more important, right? Well, I got one scripture out of the way. I get back to the Bible, right? But whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And they saw this. So here they're saying the, the descendants of Abraham, the Jewish people of, of this day are, are saying, um, now a slave has no permanent... Or, um, they answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves to anyone. How can you say that we will be set free? You know, and Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. Now think about this. He's talking about freedom. He's talking about liberty. He's talking about about that it's a liberty too. Like we're you can be free on the outside or free, but not free on the inside. He's talking about a greater liberty. He's talking about a greater independence. It means that we're 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 independence on Him, which makes us independent and free from the law of sin and death. Does that make sense? Therefore, there is now. Do you know what now means in the Bible? Right? Someone says, hey, go get me that, that stick right now, boy. Like, usually it meant I was going to get something with it. Right? But when they said now, like it was, well, let's talk about this. It's like, go get that, right? Or, or, so it's just kind of now. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free. Now watch this. Has set us free from the law of sin and death. Isn't that awesome? We're free. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And we're not free as, as slaves to just go and find our way on our own. We're, we're freed from sin so that we can stand up as sons of the Most High God and walk and talk and make a difference in this world. And that's what we're doing. That's what we're going to continue to do. But he said, a belong, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. In Galatians 5, it says this, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. It's for what? It's for freedom, right? That Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if, I, if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised he, that he is obliged to obey the whole law. You know what? He's not talking about circumcision, saying circumcision is bad. What he's talking about is when you get so legalistic about it, that you lose the the truth and the freedom in it because it wasn't about law it was about freedom and he's like if you're trying to be circumcised to make yourself right with god you're never going to get there it's just like if you're trying to read your bible to make yourself good enough for god it ain't going to work if you're trying to do good things because you're trying to make yourself good enough for god it doesn't work because you're taking it off of the finished work of Jesus and you're putting it on yourself and that's what Paul is trying to tell them right here 
you are trying to be justified by law. You who ha are trying to be justified by law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen from grace. You ever hear people say, well, I sinned, so I fell for grace? Like you, That's not what he's saying here. Do you know how you fall from grace? Is when you go back to the law. When you tr go back to trying to be good enough. When you go back to trying to earn God's blessings. God wants to bless us more than we want to be blessed. He wants to love us more than we want to be blessed. He wants us to have a good conscience more than we want a good conscience, right? But when we go to the point where we go under the law trying to get something that was given to us as a free gift, it just kills us. All there is is death in it. And we'll be walking zombies. And so Paul's saying that's when you fall from grace because grace is up here. Grace is I am here because of God's undeserved unmerited favor and when I go back to the law and try to earn why would I try to earn something I already had doesn't make any sense right and then we keep keep hitting our heads over the and over and over beating ourselves against the wall and God's like it's for freedom that I set you free don't return to that yoke of slavery. Don't go back under that burden and, and watch what I'm going to do because I'm going to set you free like you've never been set free before. Don't fall from grace. But if you do fall from grace, the Bible says that, that we can go boldly to the throne of grace with confidence in time of need. When do you need grace? When you mess up. Right? But that doesn't make you any less righteous. Because your righteousness was never based on what you do. It was always based on who he is. It just means you messed up, man. You ever, like your kids mess up and then you're like, well, you're not my kid no more. Like I've wanted to say that a few times. But it wasn't so, right? Actually, I've never wanted to say that, to be honest. Because there's nothing they could do that would ever not make them my kid. But we put these projections on a holy father that says, if, if, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your kids, how much more does your heavenly father give you good gifts? That's the father that we look at and we think of badly. Isn't that sad? It breaks my heart for my father, but it breaks my heart for people because if we don't get a hold of who he is and what he's done, we're going to keep just going back over and over and over. It's like the, the, the children of Israel who just marched around the mountain again and again because God said, this is a promise land. You're well able. And they're like, well, we're just slaves. We can't do it. There's bigger than us. I'm telling you, you are not a slave. You are not a nobody. You weren't a nobody before Jesus, and you're definitely not a nobody now. And you can do all things through Jesus Christ who strengthens you. Not because you're good, but because he is. Isn't that good news? But by faith, by what? Faith. We eagerly await through the Spirit the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ there is neither circumcision nor uncirc or neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. Value. The only thing that counts is faith, expressing itself through love. I was doing the wedding and. Oh, we always read 1 Corinthians. It seems like at a wedding. Everybody wants it. I don't know why. Mushy stuff, man. Mushy stuff. Love is patient. Love is kind. It's got all this list of love. But you know you can put God's name in there? You know why? Because the Bible says God is love. God is patient. God is kind. God is slow to anger. Man, that's not the God I was told about when I was a little kid. 
that's the God who I found who said, I want a relationship with you and you alone, right? So back to John. I was reading about whom the Son sets free, or, or if you, then you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. And then it says, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Actually, it set, means in the original, then you will know the truth. And the truth, that means the truth you know will set you free. I know the truth, and his name is Jesus. And he has set me free. So we start off here in um, <clears throat> in um, John 7. It says this, After this, Jesus went around in Galilee, purposely staying away from Judea, because the Jews there waiting to take his life. But... But when the Jewish Feast of Tabernacles was near, Jesus' brother said to him, Okay, I'm going to do the cliff notes. Okay. So Jesus' brother's like, Hey, it's coming up here. You've been doing miracles and you need to reveal yourself. And Jesus said, My time's not come till Passover. He's like, I'm not coming to reveal myself as Messiah. I'm coming to reveal myself as a Passover lamb and give my life for you guys, right? And so they went ahead and said, well, we're going anyway. You can stay here and fish or whatever you want to do. Jesus let him go. And then he shows up on his own and he starts teaching. And he's teaching and everybody's amazed at, at him. And so, so they're like, where does your teaching come from? And Jesus answered, my teaching is not my own. It comes from him who sent me. If anyone chooses to do God's will, he will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak my own. I love Jesus. Isn't he cool? He who speaks on his own does not gain, does so to gain honor for himself, but he who speaks for the honor of the one who sent him is a man of truth. There is nothing false about him. Has not Moses not given you the law, yet no one, not one of you keeps the law? Why are you trying to kill me? And they're like, we're not trying to kill you. And he's like, you're not keeping the law. He's like, like, you think you're keeping the law, but you're not keeping the law. You think that, that you're doing everything right, but you've fallen from grace. Because you're depending on yourself and your works to make yourself righteous and holy and to get blessed. And one day of favor is worth a thousand days of labor with God. And one day he can do something and change your life and he'll do it in a way you never dreamed possible. Because he's that good. So he goes on and they're still crying out and bothering him. But in 37 it says this, On the last in the great day of the feast, Jesus stood up in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scriptures have said, streams of living water will flow from within him. So now what's happening? It says on the great and final day, what is that? It's called Hoshana Rabbah, Right? In the Jewish feasts and festivals, you, you start out in the month of Elul, and then you go to Rosh Hashanah, and then from Rosh Hashanah you go to Yom Kippur, and then you have what's called Sukkot. It's called the, either the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacles, right? And it lasts for seven days, and so they had set up a tent like this, except it'd be open, and, and it reminds us that, that um, God has tabernacled with us. And at this time, Jesus is literally tabernacling with them during Sukkot. He's literally teaching them. He's literally showing them. And then on the last great day, Hoshana Rabbah is on the eighth day. And so the priest will bring water. And he'll go down to the pool of Siloam. And it's a golden pitcher. And he'll come back up and he'll pour it on the altar. And, and um, he'll say, um, Baruch Habab Hashem at Adonai. He, and hear our prayers. He'd say, Blessed are you, O Lord God. Or not, Blessed are you, O Lord God. He'd say, Save us, I beseech you. So here Jesus is sitting at this. He's telling them and teaching them, and He's right there in their presence to set them free. He's right there the whole time. And here's a priest over here with water, pouring it out, saying, Baruch Ababa Shemad Adonai, save us, I beseech you, save us, I beseech you. And I think as Jesus was sitting there hearing this, he just couldn't be quiet anymore. 
because his heart was going out and he's like, man, I'm here. I'm right in front of you. I want to give you life and living water. And so it says on the last and greatest day, Jesus stood up in a loud voice. He, it says he cried out. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me to drink. He said, I'm here for you. He's like, whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. What are you saying? Come to me. Here he is in the middle uh, of all this stuff where they're literally praying for God to send them salvation and salvation himself is right among them and they don't even see him. They're crying out for his help and Jesus' heart was to reach out for him even though they were trying to kill him. Then he goes on the next day and you find the woman caught in adultery and everyone's trying to kill her. <laughs> and Jesus like, I identify with you, lady. Let's fix this problem. And then he goes on and says, look, whom the sun sets free is free indeed. He says, you know the truth, but the truth is right among us. Truth's not mad at this world. He's not mad at the at the people around that don't know him. He's sitting there saying, Come to me, all who are weary and lost, and I will give you rest. You want independence? You want freedom? You're only gonna find real freedom in one person, and that's in Yeshua and Jesus, in the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, because independence from this world actually only comes through dependence on his grace and freedom which you'll only have true independence at. Don't ask me to say that again. We have freedom. Let's remember this as a declaration of independence to this day for our freedom. That we are free. We are free men. We are free from tyrants and we are free from the rule of, uh, of the mob, but we are spiritually free as we will ever be because of what Jesus did for us. Amen? Father, thank you. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for the opportunity to celebrate freedom and celebrate you and we give you the praise and honor for it. In the mighty name of Yeshua, amen. That's all. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to learn more about us, check out our website at www.silverlakebaptist.org.